Well, today we're going to be thinking about the Song of Solomon. And the Song of Solomon is a fairly difficult part of scripture to, to understand. And before we go further, I'd like to say that I read the Song of Solomon as flowing straight on from Ecclesiastes, which I also take to be written by, by Solomon. So then, you've got this young man, Solomon, given all this wisdom by God, which he wrote out for the most part in the book of Proverbs. And then, as we know, he, he sort of didn't put that wisdom or that knowledge, shall we say, into any kind of practical sort of sense. And he went wrong in his life. He was given all that knowledge. He shared it with other people. But then, over the course of time, he just went his own way and he sort of did everything that he could. He had a thousand women, he had wealth, he went into wine, alcohol, building, you name it, he did it. And then it seems, as I read Ecclesiastes, that he says, well, this isn't the best thing to do. It's all vanity. It's absolutely meaningless. And in the end, the best thing to do is to fear God and obey his commandments. Which, of course, is what God had told him right at the beginning. So he kind of went in a circle. And yet it seems to me that Solomon did not actually repent, and Ecclesiastes is really his writing as an old man, or an older man, saying, well, this is how it is, this is how my life has been, I tried to achieve all these things, I did all these things, and it didn't really satisfy me. So life is basically a bit of a waste of time. If I have my time again, it will be good to fear God and obey his commandments. And as I take Ecclesiastes 12, he's basically saying, it's good for the young people. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. And then the Song of Solomon was also written, it seems to me, by Solomon. And he's there reminding us of a relationship that he had with this Egyptian woman, young Egyptian girl who was Pharaoh's daughter. And it seems that he's really showing us how he actually disobeyed all the wisdom that God had given him. Because when you read the book of Proverbs, one of the themes that he keeps on and on about is beware of the Gentile woman. In the AV it says the strange woman. But that doesn't mean a, a, a girl who's sort of got uh, pink streaks in the dyed green hair or whatever, someone who's weird. But instead I would submit that the, the strange woman is really the Gentile woman. So he's saying, don't get involved with Gentile women. But of course he did that himself big time. And as you read through the Song of Solomon, there's a number of connections with the book of Proverbs. The very actions and words that he records, the Egyptian girl saying to him, are in fact the very words that he puts in the mouth of the strange woman, the Gentile woman, in the book of Proverbs. For example, in the Song of Solomon, he says to the girl, your eyes, your eyelids, your eyes captivated me. You just flashed your eyelids at me, and wow, I was absolutely taken away. I was absolutely blown over by you. I was absolutely captivated by you. And yet, in the book of Proverbs, he says, beware of the stranger, the Gentile woman, because that's what she does to the innocent young man. With her eyes and eyelids, she takes him. And he says, well, that's what happened to me. That's what I did. There's another passage um, in Proverbs, in Proverbs 7 and also Proverbs 5, where he talks about the Gentile woman <coughs> catching, catching the innocent young man, and he warns, don't come near the door of her house, because her house <coughs> is the chambers of death. And yet, the words he puts in the mouth of this girl in the Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 4, are actually saying just that. She says that, I found him whom my soul loves, that was Solomon, I held him, I caught him, I would not let him go, until I had brought him into my mother's house, into the chambers of her who begat me. Now, 
that's exactly what Solomon has been warning about in the book of Proverbs. Now, what, what's, the, uh, what's the meaning of all this? On one hand, you could say, well, Solomon was just completely hypocritical. He knew all this stuff, but he didn't do it. In fact, he did the very opposite. And yet, going deeper than that, there's something here in all this that is, I think, true for all of us. That it's okay knowing things, but knowledge alone does not mean that you actually apply that in a wise life. And the more truth, as it were, that we have, the more we understand correctly from God's word, it seems to me the greater is the temptation to disobey. To, not only to disobey, but to do the very opposite of that which we know to be right. Now, have you ever had that in your life? Have you ever perceived that in yourself? That what you know, and the fact you know it, is actually a temptation to do the very opposite. Now that is the lesson I take from Solomon, and I, all I, I see in it is an insight into the human condition. That that is how we are. Now the cynic would say, so it's better not to even get started. It's better not to get into the Bible. If the more knowledge you get, the, more, you know, the higher the stakes are. It's better to just forget it. And that's actually the conclusion I think Solomon comes to in Ecclesiastes, unfortunately. But under the sun, yes, that's how it is. But of course, that's to look at it all very negatively. God wants us in his kingdom, and we want to be in a relationship with him, which means that we want to know him. And we want him to share his knowledge with us. So then, we come to the Song of Solomon. And I don't... Uh, want to be too academic about all this, but I think we have to go through it in, uh, I I in some detail if we are to actually start to get the grips with it, and not to just read it as some sort of love song, and uh, read it through and say, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, so Solomon loved this woman, and that was that. Because the way the song is laid out in a lot of, a lot of certainly English versions, that's the impression that you would get but it's just a, a sort of a wall of text, as it were. Just some, some great love song, and that's it. That's the finish. And that's a great shame, if that's how we read it. The key, I think, to understanding it is to see that it's actually a series of dialogues between this Egyptian girl and Solomon, between the Egyptian girl and the daughters of Jerusalem, the comments of the daughters of Jerusalem, and Solomon's words to this Egyptian girl. Now in the Net Bible, this is all laid out properly, and in some versions it, it is also, that, that's also done. Um, <coughs> and that is, I think, the key, because just reading it as a load of text, you don't get that, particularly because some of the, the verse divisions are very, very poor. For example, halfway through one verse, the whole thing may change. You may actually have, let's say, the daughters of Jerusalem uh, talking to the girl. When in the first half of the verse, the girl has been talking to Solomon. So that is what I think makes it confusing. The other thing that makes it confusing, I think, is that there is this idea that this Song of Solomon is, as has been described by uh, one expositor, romance for eternity that this is some highfalutin love song with this wonderful romance and it's so intimate uh, and sexual um, and it's just some out of this world romance. But th that has never really satisfied me as an approach for a number of reasons. One, there's a lot of tension between the two of them. She obviously wants to get closer to him than he wants her to be. She dreams of bringing him back to her mother's house. She goes out looking for him and she doesn't find him. He knocks on the door late at night and it's all secretive uh, uh, and she doesn't open the door and then when she does open the door he's gone. And most of all I find unsatisfactory in terms of a romance the way the whole thing finishes which is with a sort of an argument between them in chapter 8 and in the end it's not the famous final scene that we expect where you know, the romance is supposed to end in, in a wedding it doesn't 
it ends up with the two splitting up and with some pretty hard words from her to him. The other difficulty with it being a romance is this tension that there is between the daughters of Jerusalem and the girl. Now, what role do they, these daughters of Jerusalem play? These maidens, as they are called, they, they keep on cropping up. What part do they play in this so-called romance? Yet, yeah, classically, a romance is like love at first sight, the couple meet, and then there, there are meetings between them, and it all develops, and they praise each other, and they get married and live happily ever after. But that's not what's going on in the Song of Solomon. It's really not. I mean, just read it for what it says, and that's not the case at all. My other observation is that the whole thing is very kind of carnal, almost. He praises her because of her jewelry, because of her makeup, and there's a lot of body language, let's say, involved. It's very carnal. I mean, God doesn't seem to come into the whole thing. So, let's just open the first you know, chapter, chapter 1, come straight away to verse 2, and she says, Kiss me more passionately, because lovemaking with you is better than wine. There's a lot of talk about wine. A lot of talk about wine in the song. This, that, or the other is better than wine. Well, this was also not really what the king of Israel should have been into. Wine. And, as I say, chapter 1, verse 2, lovemaking with you is better than drinking wine. Lovemaking. Well, this isn't, it doesn't start with this casual meeting and the love at first sight. Straight away, we're, we're up against a couple who are actually having sex together. And uh, without going into too much gaudy detail, it's quite apparent to all but the eyes that don't want to see that on a number of occasions in the song, there is reference to explicit lovemaking. And yet, they're not married. This is not this, is not this you know, starry-eyed romance. Not at all. This is a relationship that is wrong. This is a relationship that's not founded on God's word and it's not being done God's way. So no wonder it ends as it does with the tragic breakup. Now, straight away, in the first chapter, you get this conflict between the girl and the daughters of Jerusalem. She says, don't look upon me because my skin is dark. She's an Egyptian, so her skin was darker than the, the Jewish girls. And she's very self-justifying. She says in chapter 1, verse 5, I am black but comely, O daughters of Jerusalem. And why would she be like this? Well, the daughters of Jerusalem are basically the Israelite women, girls, young women, whom Solomon really should have courted and chosen a wife from them. But he doesn't. He's off with this Egyptian, whom he should not have married. And so straight away there's this conflict. She knows that they are really the ones that are meant to be for him, uh, and he also knows that, and they're sort of looking askance at her, and she is justifying herself. Don't look at me, chapter 1, verse 6. Don't look at me, because don't stare at me, the Hebrew means, just because I'm black, because I'm dark. There's a, you know, don't look at me. There's a sort of a tension straight away there. And both of them, both the women of Jerusalem and the girl, they talk about the love, love being better than wine. They both, in chapter 1 verse 2, chapter 1 verse 4, they use that same language. So they're kind of set up straight away as in some sort of competition with each other. And that opens up a completely different meaning when the girl says, my beloved is mine and I am his. Like, he's mine and he's not yours. And she is aware, the girl is aware that Solomon has got what she calls 
companions. She's aware that he's got other women, and she's aware that the daughters of Jerusalem are supposed to be the ones that he, he ends up marrying. And uh, a number of times she, she's almost sarcastic to those daughters of Jerusalem, and they are sarcastic back. She says, for example, chapter 1, verse 3, right at the beginning of all this, she says, your name is as ointment poured forth, therefore the young virgins love you. Chapter, or in another uh, version, in, in chapter 1, verse 4, how rightly do the young women adore you. She's intensely aware that there's a lot of other eyes on Solomon. And I think when they at times say to her, the daughters of Jerusalem say to her, like chapter 6 verse 1, where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful, amongst women? Where has your beloved turned away to? Tell us that we may seek him with you. I take that as pure sarcasm. This is just sarcasm. O most beautiful woman, where is your beloved gone? He's turned away. He's not around, is he? Wonder where he is, wonder who he's with. Tell us that we may seek him with you. It is a sarcasm. And I think that's why this girl has a very almost inappropriate sense of haste. Draw me after you, chapter 1 verse 4. Let us hurry. May the king bring me into his bedroom chamber. She's very forward. And why is she so forward, so inappropriately forward with him? I, I would say it's because she's absolutely obsessed with the competition from these other girls, and basically she wants to get Solomon in bed with her. She wants to get the deal signed. Now, Solomon has warned that the Gentile woman will be like this, but there he is, he goes and does the very thing that he knows he shouldn't do. Now, this is really a very graphic lesson for us. We read the scriptures. We are bombarded, if you like, by the word of God. We know the text of scripture. We know, really, what we should be doing. And the fact that we know really does raise the level of responsibility. Yeah, the whole principle of Luke 12, 47 and 48, where the, where the Lord says that to him who knew and still didn't do it, he will be beaten with many stripes. Now, I don't want to just leave that principle on, on a sort of a negative note, that, well, we're saddled with responsibility to God, with the knowledge of God, therefore, unfortunately, we, we better get on and, and, and live as we should because we're responsible. That will be totally negative. And yet, on the other hand, you see, we're in a relationship with him. And if we want to be in a relationship with him, and do we want it? Of course we do. That involves knowledge. He reveals himself to us. He reveals himself to us through his word. And we respond. And yet, the deeper that relationship goes, like I think in any relationship of any sort, there is the greater tendency at times to want to just turn around and walk away from it all. And sadly people do this. They do it with their Lord, with their kids, with parents, with, with partners, various kind of partners, with, with spouses. That's just a feature of human nature that we need to be aware of. Now, Solomon was aware of these tensions between this girl that he'd fallen for and the daughters of Jerusalem. She says in chapter 2 that she's just an ordinary meadow flower from, Sh from Sharon. And Solomon replies, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, like a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. He's saying, they're a bunch of thorns, but you're the lily. Now, interestingly, that's a complete subversion of the idea that Moses came out with, where he warned that the Gentile nations would be thorns to Israel, 
and that they should not therefore marry them. But Solomon turns it all around and says, ah, these, these Jerusalem girls, these Israelite girls, they're the thorns. And you, my dear, my Egyptian dear, you are the lily among the thorns. It's very sad how it all got so twisted round in his mind. If you want the reference uh, to, to thorns, Numbers 33, verse 55. So, what are we to, to take from all this? Was the girl so naive as to not know that Solomon had other women? No, she did. Solomon admits that to her in chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, where he says there may be 60 queens and 80 concubines, and young women without number, but you are unique. My beloved is but one, I think the AV says. Well, he was maybe didn't quite get up to his um, whatever it was 400 wives and 600 concubines, whatever it was at that stage. At that stage there were 60 queens and 80 concubines and young virgins without number. Uh, virgins is the right term, but anyway. But he says, okay, that's how it is, but you are unique. And she kind of falls for that. Incredible, but she did. And yet, of course, when the relationship came under pressure, she is aware of that. And she says in chapter 6, verse 13, Why do you gaze upon the perfect one, which is what Solomon called her, so she says to him, Why do you gaze upon the perfect one, that is me, like the dance of the Mahanaim? Now, Machanaim is a bit difficult to understand, but it seems to me it's talking about the dance of the two camps, or the dance of the two, two lines. It's as if she realizes there is a duality there in Solomon. You call me your perfect one, but you, why are you looking at, on all these others? Why, are you sure you don't look at me, your one and only, with some duality? like the dance of the Machanaim. So she was aware of this, very much so. And so because of that problem between the girl and the, the maidens of Jerusalem, I think that's why they keep on meeting in secret. Chapter 2 verse 14, they, they go out into the countryside and meet. He comes, chapter 3, knocks on her door late at night all the time he says to her come away, come away let's go away come away with me chapter 2 verse, verse 14 they appear to have slept together in the full sense of that uh, euphemism in the, in the open air chapter 1, 16 and 17 the lush foliage is our canopied bed the cedars are the beams of our bedroom chamber the pines are the rafters of our bedroom so they were sleeping together outside in the countryside. Why? Why not in the bed? Well, because there's all this secret meeting, you know, chapter 7, verse 11, let us spend the night together in the villages. And several times, well, twice uh, at least, there's this talk about the dawn is breaking. Before the shadows flee away, I must run back. So it's as if they spend the night together and Solomon beats it back to Jerusalem to the palace before, before dawn. There's that other time when, in chapter 3 where I think she has a nightmare where she, she says, well, by night on my bed I sought for Solomon and I looked for him and I couldn't find him and I walked around the city of Jerusalem I was found by the night watchman I was beaten up, etc. So that, I think, was a nightmare that is recorded in the psalm. And the nightmare reveals her fears, her, her sense that she is not really welcome in Jerusalem, that the night watchmen are against her. I mean, what night watchman would, would beat up the girlfriend of the king if they didn't sort of respect her? If they, if, if they respected her, they didn't respect her. And then I think in chapter, uh, later on in chapter 3, she has a dream, that's how I interpret it, 
of the wedding where Solomon comes from the wilderness um, to her and the daughters of Jerusalem are there looking on and the most that they can do is to prepare the inside of his uh, wedding chariot but he's coming to marry her and the point is the daughters of Jerusalem in her dream are just the onlookers now that was a dream her fantasy was that they would get married but that didn't actually happen the scene, the famous final scene that we're waiting for the wedding never comes instead chapter 8 they split up now several times in the song she says this thing to the daughters of Jerusalem she says I charge you daughters of Jerusalem do not stimulate my beloved do not arouse his love now she says that several times again you can understand why if she's in some sort of competition with these girls don't you attract him keep your hands off my beloved and I think the emphasis there is on the word my and yet it's a very stormy relationship because one minute in chapter 2 verse 5 she says I'm sick of love I've had enough I'm out of here I can't take this anymore and the next verse chapter 2 verse 6 having said I'm sick of love she's on about how oh I remember how he has had his left hand around my head and with his right hand he stimulated me now, take that to mean what you want it's pretty obvious what it's, what it's referring to and yet the verse before that she said I'm sick of this I'm sick of love I'm lovesick I'm out of here I, I'm through with this relationship I can't take it any, any longer now in chapter 5 we have another dream or nightmare I would say um, of the girl where Solomon comes knocks on her door at night and she's not at all prepared for him it's unexpected and so she gets out of bed and she puts her makeup on and then she thinks oh hang like I don't need to make myself look pretty for him and she fumbles at the lock of the door she's got uh, myrrh and frankincense and, and various uh, perfume all dripping over her hands she messes with the lock eventually she gets it open and he's gone there's no song and that language that's used in that section in chapter 5 is picked up later in the New Testament about searching when it's too late that he knocks on the door and he will knock on the door the Lord will knock on the door of our hearts when he comes back and if we don't open immediately we will not be saved we will not be taken to be with him and this is all taken from the language of the Song of Solomon not romance for eternity not at all this is a relationship gone wrong so really in those moments she was really living out if, if anything the type of the rejected bride of Christ and then she is mocked straight afterwards by the daughters of Jerusalem who call her almost beautiful amongst women which I have said is sarcastic and then she comes out with a great big paean of praise for Solomon how beautiful he is and all that now I think it's worth drawing attention to the perceptions that they both have of each other she wanted to see him as who she imagined he should be for her that is an Egyptian she says in chapter 8 I hate the way that I can't kiss you outside in, in the open because people would despise us I so wish I could bring you to my mother's house where's her mother's house? back in Egypt I so wish we could just be together and not be despised and mocked and that you could come, and she says this a couple of times, that you could come into my mother's house that's what she wanted she didn't want to be in Israel, she wanted to be back there in Egypt with Solomon now I believe she loved him, I think she definitely did but she wanted to be back there in Egypt with him but he was the king of Israel, he wasn't going to go and live as some sidekick in uh, Pharaoh's court just for the sake of the love of this girl and so he describes her so many times about ten times 
in terms of various geographical places in Israel. For example, he says, your hair, which is presumably black hair, looks like a flock of goats on Carmel. He likens her eyes, different parts of her body, to the, the fish towers and the Heshbon and Jerusalem, and, and etc. You look at all those geographical references, that the Tower of David, he's, in his eyes, he is seeing her as if she is an Israelite, even though she is not. He talks about our land, our people, when she wasn't at all. Beautiful as Terzah, as lovely as Jerusalem, but she was not that. And this is a problem in all relationships, not just romantic ones, although that's typically when it comes to its uh, most public and obvious kind of term, I, I guess. We imagine that a person is who we would love them to be. And we fall in love with the image of them rather than who they actually are. And this is not just a, a message for typically young folks courting each other and thinking about getting married. This is just true of life generally, that we have perceptions of people. You know, we're all basically lonely, right? We all basically would look for true friendship. Oh, we meet some, some, someone. And, oh yeah, this is going to work. This is going to be my special friend, my special buddy. And we know better than six-year-old kids, basically, at school. Making their first friends and then finding, oh, but it's not like that anymore. Or, oh, she's not really like I thought she was. And then the anger on the upset. All because there is a falling in love with the image of the person rather than who they really are. And Solomon and this girl are the classic case. The whole thing was really a, a hopeless romance. Romance for eternity? No. Not at all. She wanted him back in Egypt. And he wanted her to be the Egyptian girl, although she wasn't. Now, we come to chapter 8, and Song of Solomon chapter 8, I think is one of the hardest chapters in the Bible to understand. And I suggest that the approach that we've taken to the song is the only way really to make sense of it. She says, I wish you would set me as a, a seal, a cylinder seal upon your heart. In other words, Solomon, look, I wish that I really was the only one for you and that you would seal your heart for me, make a covenant with me, marry me, in other words, and that I would be the one and only. She says about how powerful true love is, is that nothing can quench it. But she says the jealousy is cruel as the grave. And this was the whole thing. The jealousy that she felt against the daughters of Jerusalem, that they felt against her. Then the daughters of Jerusalem come on the scene, and they say, we have a little sister, but her breasts are not developed yet. And we're going to guard our little sister and develop her. In other words, we've got the one for Solomon. And how does she respond to that? She says, my breasts are like towers. And she's quoting from one of the things Solomon says about her breasts. He was obviously reading the song. It's, a bit harder to sort of come to any other conclusion that this guy was pretty obsessed with her breasts. So anyway, she says, my breasts were as towers. And then, and notice the past tense, then did I find favor in his sight. In other words, she's saying, ah oh, yeah, you've got another suitor for the throne, for Solomon, as it were, for his, you know, to be his wife. Oh yeah, and you're worried that she's uh, not developed yet? Well, let me tell you that I am developed, and he loved it. But I was, past tense, as one that found favor in his eyes. And then she goes on to talk about this vineyard business. And she said, Solomon's got a vineyard. And he rents it out for a thousand shekels of silver. One thousand. Well, remember, this figure one thousand recurs in Solomon's life 
about the number of women that the king's record says he had. His concubines and his wives put together came to 1,000. And then she says about her vineyard. She says, my vineyard, which belongs to me, is at my disposal alone. Now, several times in the song, the image of a vineyard has been used. And normally, in a intimate, even sexual sense, she says to him, come into my vineyard, O my beloved. You can take that as you, as you wish, but it's an invitation to him to share her. Let's, let, let's put it no, uh, more forcefully than that. Um, but now she says, my vineyard, which belongs to me, is at my disposal alone. This is quite different to the girl who said, oh, my vineyard's open to you, Solomon. Please come in and eat your fruits. And he says, sure, I'll be coming in. Now, this is a, a figurative, poetic way, alluding to his own language, of saying to him, it's over now. No, Solomon, it's not your vineyard anymore. It is mine it is at my disposal alone. When previously uh, her breasts had been like grapes and stuff like that, and he was going to come and eat the grapes at his will or, and stuff like that. So, chapter 8 is really the ending of the relationship. And one feels sorry for the girl because she has said that she loves him with an unquenchable love. And then he, is, I think, sarcastically almost, his last words to her at the end of chapter 8 are saying, well, don't forget uh, the companions, that is, the daughters of Jerusalem, are listening to you. And she says, my beloved, in other words, Solomon, like I just said, love, my love for you is unquenchable. Even though you, now I figure you, you give your vineyard out for a thousand shekels, uh, you got thousands of other women. Okay, finally the pen is dropped, I see who you really are. And no, that's the end of it. Anyway, I still love you. So, my beloved, go away. Run away from me. Be gone. And that's how the, the song finishes. And that's why, I mean, the whole thing is a, a subversion, if you like, of the whole genre of, of romance. Why would Solomon do that? Well, if Solomon wrote the song, right? Why would he subvert the whole genre of, of romance where we are expecting, we are waiting for something to happen, we are waiting for the famous final scene, the walking off into the sunset, holding hands together. Why would he subvert the whole thing and say, well it started with uh, sex and jealousy and inappropriate intimacy and went through a whole load of dreaming on her part, wishful thinking on my part about her, and an argument between the two of us, and, could never quite get it together. And then, well, it blew out like, like this, that um, she didn't like the fact that I had all these other women, and yet she still loved me, but jealousy killed the whole thing. End. No comment, nothing. Well, that's why I said at the beginning that the whole song is so similar in spirit to Ecclesiastes, because that's what he's saying there, that, well, this was life, under the sun. This is how I made out, and... Uh, I did pretty well in terms of fulfilling all my lusts and all my desires, but end of story is that it didn't work out. And I think although he does not add, as he does at the end of Ecclesiastes, he doesn't add at the end of the Song of Solomon, so P.S. Therefore, guys, don't do what I did, but, you know, go, to go God's way, and well, young people, you, you should take a note from me. Um, he does, that admittedly is not added. But I think the whole thing is in that context, that he's saying, well, this is what I did. I had this really pretty girl, and I really loved her, and she really loved me. Um, but, you know, I had all these other women, and, and well, this is what happened. It was not much of a romance. It didn't end as it should have done. In fact, it was a mockery of a romance, and that's why he subverts the genre of romance uh, and of romantic songs. Uh, and, and uses that genre quite in another way to talk about a relationship that's riddled with tension and difficulty and anger, uh, jealousy and the daughters of Jerusalem, etc. Um, in this locked horns kind of conflict with, with the girl from Egypt. And that's why it comes to this unsatisfactory conclusion. So what lesson then do we take from all this? 
Now, I'm sorry this time we've been a bit expositional and almost academic, but I, I think we, we've had to be to get to grips with what is a very difficult passage of scripture. So what is the lesson? Well, where Solomon is such a lesson, such a challenge, is that he's a guy who had everything you could want. You know, most people will, will spend a lot of their life just getting a second house, getting a second car, a second apartment, a, 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 a certain boat that they always wanted, a certain career that they always wanted. People spend a huge amount of mental energy in relationships. Oh, I want that fella. Ah, that one didn't work out. I want that man, and that man, and that man, or that girl, or that woman. A woman like this, a woman like that. And, and so their lives go, and they come to old age, if they get to old age, uh, and what have they got? They just wasted their lives, their energy, their time, their, their work, their labor, and it's all been for nothing. And yet there's Solomon who says, okay, women? Yeah, thousand of them, prettiest. Uh, of the lot. Yep, I did that. Alcohol? Yep. He says Ecclesiastes 2. Yeah, I tried that. Building? Yeah, got into that. Went to the end with it. Built the most amazing palaces, gardens, etc. Trees? Gardening? Yep. Went into that. Went to the very end of it. And that's the challenge of Solomon. That every human desire and temptation, he picked up and went to the very end with it. And he still lived to tell the story. And yet it wasn't much of a story he had to tell. It was just that it's all vanity. It's an emptiness. It's a chasing after wind. And Song of Solomon is, is uh, I, I guess, the uh, commentary that he has there in, in a sort of sexual sense of, sense of personal relationships, but not doing it God's way and just following your own lust. Well, that's, wh that's what it comes to. And that's such a challenge. Now, unfortunately, we're all empirical learners, and we tend to say, well, I'll learn, you know, that flame is hot by putting my finger in it. And I'm not going to learn any other way. And that is where God's Word, of course, makes or should make the huge difference. That you don't have to put your finger in the flame to learn that the flame is hard. God's Word is telling us all through what the real bottom line is about life, about our own nature, about our whole human and social condition, etc. And it's for us to accept that. And this is where I think the Lord Jesus was so unique that he did not learn anything by actually going and sinning and then realizing that, ah, yeah, well, it doesn't actually come to much anyway. The Lord Jesus was unique in that he took God at his word. God said, and that was it. No empirical learning as such. He accepted God's word just as it is for what it is. And that is what we're called to do as well.